Okay. Welcome to those of you who Hello. are joining us now. Um, <clears throat> I can see we've 45 people and rising joining our participants list. You're very welcome to International Dark Sky Week. Uh, we okay. Welcome to those of you who Hello. are joining us now. <clears throat> see we've 45 people and rising joining our participants list. You're very welcome to International Dark We have a uh, slight technical hitch there on the sound. Sorry about that. Um, you're very welcome, folks. Um, we look forward to uh, the evening ahead. We are journeying on our day six on our road trip around County Mayo. And tonight we are moving to the gorgeous village of Mulrani. So just while you are joining, if I could draw your attention, please, to um, those of you who haven't been with us uh, so far, we like to do a word cloud poll of all of the attendees we have with us as to where you are coming from. So we have um, set up menti.com if you have a smartphone or a, um, a second window browser and you can type in uh, menti.com and then use the code 21719516 or you can pop um, your phone to the screen and use the QR code that we have up on the screen. So 21719516 is the code and we will be um, popping that into the chat as well in a moment now. So you're all very welcome, as we say. Uh, we are going to be joining Mulrani, and um, in a moment, I'll be handing you over to Carol Loftus, our host for the evening, and she has uh, quite a treat in store. Um, it'll be like we're physically joining Mulrani, and I have to say, having had a sneak preview, if I wasn't uh, living 10 minutes down the road, I would definitely be booking my holidays there after seeing uh, what Carol has for us. So folks, I'm going to unshare that screen and we might take a quick look at where you're all from. Just bear with me a second so we can move to our Menti poll. So let's have a look. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. Is that coming up, Carol? Yeah, that's there, Georgia. Thank you. So let's have a look now, everyone. Um, we have a strong contingent from Claire Morris. You're very welcome. I haven't seen Claire Morris before on our list this week. Uh, we have, again, Dublin. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for sticking with us. And once again, New York. I think um, it's uh, every day this week. So thank you. Um, we must return the compliment. Um, we have County Donegal. We have Ballycroy with Castlebar. We have Count, uh, Newport, uh, where I am. Uh, Hackney again, welcome. Ark in Germany again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, Eglinton, Northern Ireland. So we have, and Westport, of course, we have a very wide and uh, diverse reach. So uh, we really appreciate that. And we hope you're gonna enjoy um, our evening in Mulrani um, and our, our guest speaker, Colin Stafford Johnson in a few minutes. So before um, we meet Colin, I'm going to hand over to our host this evening, Carol. And if I could just ask you to put any comments that you might have into the chat box at the bottom of the screen and any questions that you have into the Q&A box. Um, and then I will hand over to Carol, who is secretary of our Mayo Dark Skies, uh, Friends of Mayo Dark Skies Committee. She does an awful lot of work for Dark Skies and she's also the host uh, for the physical Mayo Dark Sky Festival uh, each uh, November. Over to you, Carol. Lovely, thanks very much, Georgia. Delighted to be here. Uh, look, I'm delighted to welcome you all here to the International Dark Sky Week 2021 virtual roadshow of County Mayo, which tonight is coming from beautiful Mulrani, one of the gateway villages to the Mayo Dark Sky Park. We've really enjoyed the virtual tour of Mayo so far. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I know everyone is very much looking forward to tonight's event. It's one of the best known faces on Irish television and the foremost nature and wildlife cinematographer and presenter in Ireland today, Colin Stafford Johnson. Before I introduce Colin though, I'm just going to show you some lovely images of Mulrani. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the area here in Mulrani, about our community, and I'm going to share with you some of the environmental work that we are doing here and that we have done here. Um, there's a lot of community interest groups in Mulrani that, and they're very, very active. And many of those groups have a strong focus on the environment and conservation. Uh, we have Mulrani Environmental Group, which is also a clean coast group, Mulrani Tidy Towns. We have a Mulrani Green Plan Group. 
Morani Gift of Hands ladies who make goods from recycled materials. And we have the Old Irish Goat Society who are trying to preserve um, Ireland's native land race breed of goat. Um, we're also involved in the Friends of Mayor Dark Skies. And we take part in the Mayor Dark Sky Festival every year, which has been running for a number of years in November. And we concentrate on the environmental side of Dark Skies mostly. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that later on. And um, just a little bit of history since we are talking about uh, Dark Skies. Um, Mulrani had electric light here in 1897, would you believe? Um, the hotel here was built in 1897 and it had a special generator to create uh, generate electricity. Uh, but nowhere else in the village had electricity till 1951. And our closest neighbouring village in Ballycroy, where the visitor centre is for the National Park, didn't have electricity until 1964. And that's not that long ago, you know, it's fairly recent. I won't say I don't remember it, but I, I, thank God, but it is fairly recent. So that was in our parents' time and in our grandparents' time. And the skies must have been absolutely amazing at that time, even more dark than they are now. Uh, so I'm just going to start a little presentation um, that I have ready here from Mulvaney. So I'll just share the screen there now. So just bear with me. Now, can you see that, Georgia? Not yet, Carol. Just... Okay, hold on a second. How about now? Yeah. Yeah, it's just loading. Oh, great. Up. Yeah, into presenter mode. Now that's fine. Perfect. Now, so this is Mulrani. It's a gateway village to the Mayor Dark Sky Park. And welcome, as I said, to International Dark Sky Week. And you can see Mulrani there is between uh, the most southerly point of Black Sod Bay and Clue Bay to the south. It's in an absolutely beautiful uh, location. Uh, just to give some little context to people who are, you know, signing in from around the world. This is um, Ireland Dublin here, and this is County Mayo. And Mulrani is just here on the, uh, the northern shores of Clue Bay looking south. A uh, little bit more context. Mulrani is at a hub of three, U, three EU Natura 2000 sites. You have the Curran uh, Plateau, uh, Clue Bay, and you have Nafe and Avion Duff um, mountain range there. And this is the Mayor Dark Sky Park, you can see here, which is just north of Mulrani. And this is the Great Western Greenway uh, running along or along by the shoreline there of Clue Bay. So these are some of the Mulrani views, and they're absolutely amazing. This part of the world is stunning. So that's the view from the village looking out across Clue Bay and out towards Crow Patrick, uh, Ireland's holy mountain on the far side. This is one of our beautiful beaches that we have here in Mulrani, absolutely gorgeous beaches, clean, clean water, absolutely stunning. This, uh, these are some of the islands of Clue Bay here, you can see them here, another beautiful view. Uh, this is taken looking towards the village, looking north towards Mulrani village and you can see the, this is taken from Mulrani Pier and the beautiful crystal clear water. This is Mulrani Beach, another beach. And I, I'd just like to draw your attention to the very end of the beach there. I don't know if you see my cursor, Georgia. Yeah, well, I managed, I found, if you look at the very end of the beach there, I'm going to show you what that was. It was a really hot day. And this was what was on the beach. The cattle had the cows come down for a swim. So that was a, a novelty for all the visitors who were here on their holidays. They couldn't believe that the cows, but they do go in regular when it's really hot. They go in for a cool down. Uh, this is the Victorian Causeway that leads um, brings you can walk across this from the village out towards the Blue Flag Beach. It links the village to the Blue Flag Beach. Now, this area is tidal, so that's kind of a lagoon there, and the tide comes in and out there uh, every day, twice a day. Uh, this is a photograph of the moonlight over Clue Bay from Mulrani. Now that was taken at 10 past 11. You can see that in, in a, on some day in July and how bright it is. You know, so not all skies are really that dark, but the moonlight is very important for, I suppose, pollinators and different animals. So I think that's a really lovely photograph, the moonlight of, over Clue Bay. So this is a little bit more about Mulrani. It's located at a crossroads of marine and terrestrial habitats. It's a microcosm of Mayo and it displays a really highly diverse terrain, flora and fauna. And Mulrani is just nestled there in the hillside there, looking over Clue Bay. Uh, this is the Nathan mountain range, which is just behind Mulrani, another beautiful, stunning landscape. Uh, Ballycroy National Park, which is north of Mulrani as well. This is part of the Mayor Dark Sky Park. 
That's another beautiful photograph of Ballycroy. This is taken looking north up towards Black Sod Bay. That's Bella Crawher Bay, which is part of Black Sod Bay. It's the most southerly point of Black Sod Bay. And that's the view looking north up towards Black Sod. Uh, there's Clue Bay and some of its islands. Uh, that's looking across at Crow Patch on a cloudy day. It's not sunny all the time, but most of the time. That's why I picked mostly sunny photographs. Yeah. And this is the Rasmur of a Mac here. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. That's a really rare habitat. That's the Mulrani Salt Marsh. That's Dawn over Clue Bay. That's a Primrose on Rasmur around the Mac here. And that's Bird's Foot Trefoil on the Mac here. Now, these are some of the, Mulrani is very rich in natural heritage. These are some of the, those flora and fauna that we get here. Uh, beautiful, amazing insects and beautiful animals. There's the Brent geese. We have peregrine falcon that we see there and skylarks out on the Mac here. These are hares that were taken, photographed taken out on the Mac here. And this is an otter. Okay, we do have a lot of otters here. There's a lot of rivers here and we have a lot of otters in the, in the locality. We're very lucky. So this is the Rasmur of a Mac hare. Uh, Mac hare is one of Europe's rarest habitats. And that word means a low grassy um, plain. You see it here, it usually comes up behind the beaches here. It's a priority habitat of the EU in the EU Habitats Directive. And Ireland holds one third of the world's Mac hare dunes. And the finest of these are to be found on the County Mayo coastline in North Mayo and here in Mulrani and other locations. There's some on Ackville as well. So, you can see here, like with climate change, there was a lot of storm damage to uh, our beautiful Mac Air. So the community decided that they were going to do something about this because the ecosystem of plants and flowers was in danger of being lost. And that would have been terrible and absolute tragedy. So the community got together and they and the farmers and they fenced off a large area here and they destocked it, took the animals off it. You can see the fencing there to try and let it, uh, you know, come back to repair itself. And this wasn't easy. As the dune grew, they had to, you know, they had planted marron grass. And as the dune grew in height, more fencing had to be added just to protect the, um, and fenced off again to keep the animals off the land. And you can see that there after, now it took us seven years to complete this uh, conservation effort. And that after a number of years, that dune system is completely restored now. And you can see the drift line there, which is very important. And you can see the dune and the mac here is just in behind the dunes here. So, so you can see here some of the plants, the pioneering plants. There's that uh, fencing there, you can see it there. And the bird's foot trefoil is starting to re-establish itself when the dunes started to build. And there's some of the marron grass that was uh, planted to help, this, help the dunes to re-establish themselves. So this is the, um, the bird's foot trefoil. This is just a kind of a close-up of that. Um, that's sea camp, and I'll talk about that now in a second. And there's ladies' bed straws, another uh, beautiful plant, but they're like pioneering plants. That come in. So that sea campion, the, that's a, can you see that there? That's pollinated by moths and it emits a really strong scent in the evening. You know, not during the day, it mostly is very strong scent in the evening to attract the moths. And I know that um, Mayor Dr. Skies were hoping to do or start a research project with uh, Mayo School um, soon uh, to look at that sea campion to see, you know, what different types of lighting, what, how that will affect the pollination of that plant. So watch this space and we'll hopefully have some kind of figures. We'll be able to tell you how, you know, light pollution is affecting that very important uh, plant there. Uh, this is another very rare uh, moth that we have here on the Mac here. It's called a belted beauty moth. I don't know if many people may not have seen that. Uh, and that emerges in April. And that needs the, uh, you know, the natural cycle of erosion and deposition of sand to survive. And it feeds on that pioneering birds for trefoil and the ladies bed straw. Uh, the larvae emerge in June and they burrow into the soft sand and they feed at dawn and dusk. So they're only found in 15 sites in Ireland and 13 of those are in Mayo and here in Mulrani we have that very rare moth. So we don't really know if light pollution is affecting that moth so we hope in the future to do some kind of a survey on that because it is very rare and as you can see the female has no wings. The male has wings and the female has no wings and that's the larvae that feeds on the birds for trefoil. Uh, so we, we use that now, all that um, conservation work we've done on the Mac Air has turned out to be, you know, a fantastic um, sustainable tourism uh, guide for us. We can bring people and we explain to them all about how the Mac Air is formed and about how the, how, what an important habitat it is. So 
So, you know, people come along and they really enjoy it and we can employ somebody to um, give that talk and explain to everybody how the macro works and they really enjoy, enjoy that. Uh, this is the Great Western Greenway that runs through Mulrani. Uh, that's another asset, that's an underused asset that we had, the old railway line that was developed. So that runs from Atwell to Westport and it's going out now as far as Lewisburg. So that's another asset that we have. And the Hotel in Mulrani has started an a food trail called the Gourmet Greenway. So you can go along and meet all the local food producers on the Greenway. And then you can go back to the Mulrani Park Hotel and have a lovely dinner. And I see Sean Kelly there from Newport. He makes fabulous sausages and we have uh, mussels and crabs and all sorts of local food. And it's really amazing local food. And it's a great sustainable initiative. We have no food miles with that. It doesn't depart so. Uh, these are some of the festivals. This is our Met Met Morani Mediterranean Heather Festival it takes place in June. And that's like a cultural festival and for the community. You can see our pipe band. And this is the old Ackle Yall, which was used for um, years ago to bring turf to carry people um, or in this part of Ireland. Very old sailing boat. Uh, we have a Stonewall Festival where we are trying to preserve our stone walls. The stone walls are a very important part of the landscape in Ireland and here in Mayo especially, the striped landscape. And we, people come here to help us to repair those walls because we can't do it ourselves. So uh, we're supported by the Dry Stone Wall Association of Ireland and they, people really love it. They come and they get to meet the local people, get to work with us to repair those walls. And we have, you know, we go for dinner in the evening and we have a music session and, you know, they, they leave behind a legacy on the landscape when they're gone and they really enjoy it. This is uh, in 2019. That's the gap in the wall there. They didn't realise they were going to have to fill that gap when they came. They were all smiling very happily. But um, they managed to do it. And that's then the wall is nearly finished. So it was, it was great. Um, people really enjoyed that. That festival is going on now since 2015. And it's been a great success. Uh, we also have um, our, one of Ireland's native goats, a very rare animal. And we discovered that Mulrani had a herd of really you know, old native goats that were forgotten about. So we had them DNA studied and we compared them with other goats around Europe and in uh, the UK, Iceland, and we discovered that these animals are extremely rare. And you can see on the bottom there, it says the DNA results highlight the Morani goat herd as a unique population in need of protection. And that was done by Lara Cassidy and the Smurfit Genetic Institute. So we've done our best to try to help to save those animals. We have a captive breeding program and a new sanctuary. Uh, that opened in 2020 and we also support local craft workers uh, who sell their goods there in the uh, visitor center. Uh, so dark skies, this is another sustainable tourism asset. We do, you know, try to do some things with the Perseid Meteor Watch. We have beach walk, uh, the Morani, they observe the moon night. And the hotel now have now taken this on board. They attended the dark sky ambassador program and they're using this, you know, they have stargazing, after their dinner and their your logo's written in the stars. So it's great to see that this is, you know, starting to get a bit of it. Of, you know, people are starting to use the dark skies as a, a tourism event. People love it and they go out and out to and get a, a lesson in the stars. Um, we also take part in the Mayor Dark Sky Festival. I'd recommend that to everybody. Uh, Newport kind of, you know, does science. Valley Croy does arts and creativity and Mulrani does um, environmental talks. So these are some of the people we've had um, visit us and speak at our festival and they've been top class speakers and I'd recommend it to everybody to if they can to come to Mayo to the Dark Sky Festival and this is the last slides you'd be delighted to hear uh, this is um, our patron uh, Duncan Stewart and Duncan is one of Ireland's leading advocates for environmental and conservation issues for over 40 years and he comes to our festival every year and Duncan I love this little piece that Duncan says I'm just going to read this to you because this is what Duncan said at um, our festival uh, dark sky places are very rare and unique. They are a place to observe the stars and the universe, a place to reach out across our skies at night, to observe and reflect on its endless time and space. Ooh. And it's true mystery and a magic place for astronomers. Mayor Dark Sky is a unique destination. It is a place where the undisturbed darkness protects the circadian rhythms of wild species and the conditions where humans have evolved over thousands of years. It is where you can rediscover this rare quality of true tranquility, serenity, and peace. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and now, yeah, now before I introduce uh, Colin, we're going to play a little piece of um, 
one of his uh, programs that he produced, uh, and that is Wild Ireland. We're going to play a little snippet of that, and then we'll introduce Colin to you all. The west coast of Ireland for millennia was really, I guess, the edge of the known world. Our ancestors had no idea what lay beyond the horizon. The vast Atlantic was a place of complete mystery. My name is Colin Stafford Johnson. I've spent 30 years working as a wildlife cameraman around the world and I've seen some of the most beautiful places on earth, but somehow I'm always drawn back to the west coast of Ireland. And this is where I now call home. Once you've lived by the sea for a part of your life, it's very hard to leave it behind. I love its isolation and its wildness. I've always wanted to travel the length of Ireland's Atlantic coast, seeking out its wild creatures. So much of life is sort of timetabled, and when you don't have a timetable, you can't be late. When you don't have a destination, you can't get lost. And if my journey has any direction, I guess it's roughly north. I suppose in ways I'll be wandering up the west coast, a wander of 1,500 miles. And I think it's going to change my view of the island that I've lived on for much of my life. Absolutely fantastic, fabulous work, Colin. Uh, look, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Colin Stafford Johnson to Mulvaney and to this Mayor Dark Sky International Dark Sky Week event. Uh, Colin is one of the best known faces on Irish television and definitely the foremost nature and wildlife cinematographer and presenter. Well, for the last years. Myself and the yeah. Latin Dubliners have been singing its praises for 25 minutes. Oh, there was no way to get the full story of Dublin into an hour. You could be... There's some voice coming over that, George, is there? Sorry. My apologies. Yeah, it's okay. No bother. Anyway, yeah, Colin has won many awards for his work and the program Ireland's Wild River, which is based on his exploration by Canoe with the Flora and Fauna of the River Shannon through four seasons and one of my favourite programmes ever, won the Golden Panda Award at Wild Screen. Colin has also written and presented Wild Ireland, The Edge of the World on BBC Two. Uh, you've just seen a wonderful clip from that programme. Uh, Colin has also taken viewers on a journey along our own spectacular coastline here in Ireland. Uh, at the moment, Colin is working on a new program, a new gardening program for the BBC. In this program, we're going to follow Colin's journey as he makes a native garden that will become home to the smaller creatures. The garden will be made using no herbicides, pesticides or fertilizers, and there will only be 100% native plants. And Colin is going to show us, his audience, what is possible with a small piece of land and how it can be turned into a paradise for creatures such as moths, dragonfly, damselflies, butterflies, newts and frogs. And this one acre piece of land, which is beside a woodland, will be a hive of insect and amphibian activity. Uh, Colin, I know, has already counted a lot of species of dragonfly. I'm sure he'll tell us about this now. I'm actually really looking forward to this program myself and how I can learn more about how we can have nature. So without much further ado, welcome very Colin. It's great to have you here and I'll hand over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Carol. And thank you to everyone for joining in wherever you are around the world. Um, I actually live myself in Clue Bay, not too far from Mulrenny. And uh, it's nice to be involved uh, in this week, I have to say. I was in my garden, actually, which is in County Wicklow on the east coast of Ireland last weekend. And it happened to be one of those 
particularly uh, beautiful still nights one of those nights when you feel you could almost sort of reach out and touch the sky the air is takes on an almost brittle quality and i was sitting out on my little porch and just thinking you know you always get that sense well for me it's just a great sense of peace and relaxation when you're in a really dark place and i have noticed in my travels around the world in recent years how everything is getting brighter and every bit of not just uh, you know more urbanized landscapes but many rural landscapes are getting brighter too but i'm lucky to have this little uh, this little piece of darkness in county wicklow and uh, i was looking up there at the stars last week and then about 10 o'clock at night and in the distance i heard the long-eared owls start to call now, there are, there are species which very few people really in Ireland see. They're not a particularly common owl. You'll often see in films that are made in, uh, in Ireland that they will actually put on the call of a tawny owl. But tawny owls actually aren't found in Ireland. They're the ones with this sort of traditional hooting call. But long-eared owls are actually the common ones here. And uh, the reason why, it, if tawny owls actually did make the way from Britain to here, there probably would be a, less, a lot less longer owls. But the most beautiful, they're the most beautiful owl. And I was thinking, how could my garden, how could my one acre sort of affect that owl? And the idea, as Carol was saying, of this garden is that it's to try and uh, look at, I suppose, land management in a very different way. We had this, I guess, traditional idea of creating, a, you know, a pretty sterile buffer around our houses. But the idea of this program is that so many of the, so much of rural Ireland, so much of rural Europe has really been, uh, has really been sterilised of so much of its wildlife. The intensification of farming has had a huge effect on the smaller creatures. So once upon a time, when you had a sort of um, an area around your house, it was fine maybe to make a buffer, that sort of sterile buffer. But now maybe we should look at it in a different way and think, how about creating wildness around where we live? And then all these creatures. So it's almost as if it acts like a little sort of refugium where uh, all these creatures can uh, enjoy their lives and live out their lives. Um, and then one day when we sort of learn to maybe use the land a little bit better, when we get cleverer as how we manage our land, that from places like this, those insects can spread forth across the landscape once more. Anyway, I was there watching and a little bat came by. And I was reminded, you know, we have just nine little bats in Ireland, nine insectivorous bats. Wonderful creatures, extraordinary creatures. So I get a few midges at my place, but some of these bats can hoover up two and a half thousand midges in a single night. So, um, and they're the most extraordinary creatures. You know, I only learned recently there's a there's a bat that's actually the fastest animal in the world. I used to think it was the peregrine falcon, but in fact, in level flight, the Mexican free-tailed bat can fly at about 100 miles an hour. Peregrine can only manage about, or the, the swift can manage about 70. Okay, the peregrine can sort of dive at extraordinary speeds. But for powered flight, that's actually held by a bat. Wondrous creatures, and ones which uh, here I could just see them flitting against the starlight. A tiny little bat, a pipistrelle. I, I didn't have my bat detector with me, but I assumed it was the common pipistrelle. That's the, the most sort of commonly found bat in Ireland, I suppose. And um, it got me thinking generally about bats and moths there were moths flying around as well and that sort of relationship moths look as if they're just flying around waiting to be caught but some of them have the most extraordinary you know evasion techniques um there's one i've heard of when when it hears a bat's coming it just closes up its wings and drops into the vegetation wherever it is and there's one the uh, some of some of the tiger moths have been discovered to actually jam the bat signal so bats when they're going around at night they're using echolocation and what the moths are doing they've developed a little organ that the, the tinple and they they by 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 scraping these sort of scales together they can actually jam the bat's incoming signal and so as it approaches the bat at the last minute you can see it's trying to make up its mind because it's actually interfering with that signal the bat has this extraordinary ability to hone in on a very specific thing you know to catch an insect or a midge in pitch darkness and but by sending out these little singles this uh, signals this moth is able to avoid predation. And now there's a friend of mine, and I'm, I have to say this, I haven't checked this out on purpose, but there's a friend of mine who um, studies moths, and he was telling me there's one particular moth uh, which advertises its presence to um, uh, bats in a particular way. Um, it can, it actually managed to generate uh, an extraordinarily loud sound as the bat is just coming to approach it. And it does this by rubbing its genitalia together. Now, you've got to admire 
um, an animal that can fly around in the dark and find its food and scare away uh, potential predators by uh, by just uh, literally um, making sounds by rubbing its genitalia together. Anyway, um, this guy is a bit of a practical joker. So that may not be true, but I'm going to wait till after this to find out whether it is. But knowing the natural world, sure, it's very, very possible. Um, my work as a wildlife cameraman, it takes me all around the world. And last year I had the good fortune, or a couple of years ago, to go to the island of Cuba. And the scene that we really wanted to capture was the events that happen at the mouth of a bat cave at night. Now, there are some of the, uh, Cuba is essentially a limestone island. And as a result of that, over the millennia, these massive cave systems have developed underground as the rain gradually uh, uh, um, burrows away at the limestone. And you get these massive congregations of bats, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands perhaps, that live deep underground. Now, when you approach one of these things in the evening, you know, you're approaching through the sort of a normal tropical sort of the tropical heat. It's it's pretty warm there, even 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 when the sun's going down. But when you get to this cave, I cannot describe to you the over well the overwhelming stench. I suppose is one thing because coming from what seems like the very bowels of the earth is this hot air that's laden with moisture. Now you don't really want to think about where either the heat comes from or the moisture comes from. But neither say, there are thousands and thousands of bats underground. They are defecating there. Having gathered insects all night, they return to the cave, they defecate there. So the heat is generated partially by all that sort of breaking down as the bacteria break that down. It generates a huge amount of heat. And then there's just the fact that there are tens of thousands of bodies. It really is like, it's a, it, it's almost like standing in front of an oven. You know, when you open an oven, you go, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. You get this blast of hot air. Well, it's sort of, lab, it's sort of like that, but just imagine that air also being laden with, well, what could we say? Uh, bats bodily fluids, I suppose. Anyway, um, you'd kind of think, but well, why would you want to hang around there? Well, at the entrance to this cave are all these uh, boas, these Cuban boas. They are um, they're a relatively rare snake, but they tend to gather at the entrance to these caves. Um, and, what they, um, and what they do is they essentially fish for these bats. So they come along, you watch them arriving in the evening, and they go along the roof of the cage, and then they will hang down almost like fishing lines. Uh, and they have an ability to actually, they can't see the bats in the darkness as such in, in a normal way, but they are able to detect the heat that the bats generate as they fly out. Now, it's this constant battle that's been going on for years because uh, some of those bats might be 20, 30 years old and they come out of that cave every night flying back and forth and they have to fly through this gauntlet. But standing there in the dark and trying to film this thing is quite interesting because we've got these big snakes moving around. Now, the bats attract all sorts of creepy crawlies. I mean, if you don't like creepy crawlies, um, this isn't really a place that you want to be. There's all sorts of scorpions and beetles and things whose that names I really don't need to know. These are creatures I don't really need to meet again. But little creatures, um, which are all there to sort of feed on the, the sort of ecosystem that the bats have generated. Um, when you're filming these things at night, you're using infrared cameras. You don't want to disturb the bats. So the thing is, you, you could see me. So the cameraman could see me, but I couldn't see anything. And you just have that sense of something, of just things going by your head. But because it's so absolutely pitch dark, you can't see them. And uh, so it's quite an odd feeling. So you can have snakes hanging down from the roof and catching bats just over your head and you're completely sort of unaware of it. So it's a very, it's a very odd situation, but it made, for, um, it made for a good sequence. And it got me thinking about uh, generally darkness and you know, um, events, like, um, events like this, islands that I've traveled around the world are some of the sort of darkest places. I spent a lot of time on them, uninhabited islands in places like Indonesia. And at night you get that incredible full sky, you know, when it starts at the very bottom, right down the horizon and just wraps, just wraps around you completely. I remember camping on, uh, on, on, on the beach there on my own on this Indonesian island one night and I canoed out of this island. I canoed out of sight of land to get to this island. I walked the island during the day. I knew there was no one living on this island. And I set up my tent at night and then, uh, 
I woke up in the middle of the night thinking, what on earth is that? And there was a sand was being thrown against my tent. And I thought, I used to do this as a kid, you know, if my brothers were sleeping in the tent, I'd go fire sand at the tent and wake them up. And immediately I thought, oh, this is a person. It was only actually when I got out of the tent and realised it was a turtle. And the, the net, uh, I had no idea. And that's the wonderful thing about sometimes now in the age of information, we sort of know everything that's going to happen before it happens. But there I just wandered onto this island. I had no idea that's a turtle nesting island. And I woke up in the middle of the night to be surrounded by these things. And it was a, a pretty, uh, a pretty wonderful experience, I have to say. But there are wonderful, and, 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 and when you get those mass, I think one of the greatest spectacles in the natural world is when you get these Aribales where thousands and thousands of turtles come onto these tropical beaches at night and uh, they come ashore to lay their eggs. And I think there's something about seeing an event where you can only sort of half see it, uh, but at night your senses are somehow, uh, they, are, they are sort of raised so much, you're incredibly aware of the sort of, um, of sound and that sort of thing. And you're really straining your eyes. And over time, you really get to see better and better. But it somehow makes, uh, it, it makes something all the more exciting, I think, and more perhaps mysterious if it happens. Um, at night. Um, at one of the great events in Ireland for me, and an event which very few um, Irish people ever get to uh, witness, is the arrival of the Manx Shearwaters uh, onto our offshore islands in, uh, I guess, March or April um, every year. Manx Shearwaters, Manx Shearwaters are these oceanic seabirds. They're perfectly adapted for life in the ocean. They have uh, uh, these sort of narrow wings which are perfect for gliding over the ocean wave. You'll often have seen them if you go out on a boat, you take a car ferry off Ireland, you'll see these birds flying. Well now they come ashore on our offshore islands, um, probably uh, near the end of March. And the males and females meet up there. They're a long-lived bird. They can live for maybe 50 or 60 years. Um, and they come to these islands to breed. So the couple will meet up and they will uh, they'll meet up in March um, and they'll get to know each other again. Uh, and after mating, actually, the female will go off to sea to feed for a couple of weeks. And um, they do these extraordinary journeys. They spend the winter off the coast of Brazil or someplace like that. And then they come to colonies off uh, the west coast of Ireland and indeed off uh, Britain, Wales and Scotland and places like that. That's where the majority of the Manx water population of the world is found. But when they do come ashore at night, because it's so dark, uh, in order to find each other and, and in order to locate their mates, um, they start calling. They do, they do this most extraordinary sort of call. The males call to the females and vice versa. And it's an absolutely haunting sound. If you ever get a chance to witness this, if you're in Ireland, they, yeah, probably the easiest place to witness it is the Great Blasket Island uh, because you can actually stay there. So um, you can take a boat for over from Ventry or something like that. And you can go and stay in Peg's house. If people may not be familiar with Peg, some of our overseas friends, but Peg Sayers was a woman who lived on the Blasket Islands. And she wrote a book, uh, a book in the Irish language, which, um, well, people have various opinions of, of this book. But uh, let's just say at the time I was in school, I didn't appreciate it very much. Uh, and I ended up anyway staying in Peg's house. But Peg's house is where you go. You can stay there. It's like a hostel if you want to hear the shearwaters. Uh, you also get hundreds of grey seals, up to a thousand grey seals on the beach. You get, you know, hares boxing at this time of year, all sorts of things. But um, to be there to witness these shearwaters arriving, to, to that sound at night, is, is, and it's an incredibly Irish sound. Uh, it's certainly a sound from these islands, us and their, and, and their neighbouring islands. It's very much a sound from this part of the world, but it's a sound that very few people, I think, are familiar with. Um, but it's something, it really is something worth doing. If, if people say to me, oh, you know, it's the one place I should go or some event I should, I say, get yourself out to an island like this. And the darker it is, the better. They only come in at night because if they came in during the day, that they would be predated by gulls uh, and other things. They're so well adapted to life in the ocean. They've got the narrow wings, but they've got feet very far back on their bodies. So that's fine for swimming around on the ocean surface. That's what you want. That's how you get momentum, but not very good if you're walking on land. So they tend to sort of crash into land and waddle about the place. Now, I wanted to film them on the Skellig Islands, um, and they, uh, Skelligs, for people who aren't familiar with it, you might have seen them in Star Wars for our overseas guests, but uh, there's a monastic settlement on the top of this island. 
And it's the most extraordinary place. There's this series of stone steps leads up to the top of this island and up to this monastic settlement. And um, when you're up there at night watching the sun go down, it is one of, I think it's the view in Ireland that I, ha that I have to say is of global quality. When you're actually on the very peak of the Skellings and you look across to the coast of Kerry, there's an absolutely dramatic and dark coastline for the most part, I'm glad to say. And then you're sort of high above the sea, so it appears to be this sort of inky black colour. Um, and then as the sun sets and all the diurnal sounds, all the puffins and, and razor bills and guinewats, they all stop making noise. And then there's silence for a while. And then the sounds of the sheer waters as they arrive. And they come into these little monastic settlements and they move around the place. And I was lucky enough when I was filming there, most of them go straight on the ground, but a couple of them had gone into the, all the, uh, into the little, um, uh, the little stone built uh, sort of monks houses, as it were, into the little cellars. And they were just nestled above ground in but in the darkness and uh, you could see them meet up and that's sort of thing. the thing the, the, the males normally do the first bit of incubation they share the duties they just lay a single egg and they look after that chick for a couple of months and after a couple of months that chick is then left at this stage it's heavier than its parent the parents go off on these extraordinary foraging uh, trips of maybe hundreds of miles to find enough food to feed the chick and then they return every few days. So that chick is there in the nest for a couple of months. It gets enormous. It gets very fat. And then one night the parents just leave us and never come back. And so you see the chicks then looking a little bit bewildered and they come to the entrances of the burrows out of, after a night or two and they're looking around thinking, you know, is there no one coming back to feed me? And that's it. They are on their own from that moment forth. They have to, they have to set off into the world all by themselves. Um, they're, as I said, they're very poor taking off on, from land. Um, but when, when, when they, they tend to find a rock and they climb to that rock to get a little bit of lift and they wait for a wind and then they launch themselves off into the blackness for, uh, for the first time. There are quite a few of these juvenile birds that are around in um, that leave the nest in sort of September. They run into problems actually by uh, um, uh, because they're attracted sometimes to lights. They get confused by lights, coastal lighting, and they end up in some of the towns around like Jingle and places like that. They actually land on the ground in some place on the jetties or even people's gardens. And once they do that, they really can't take off again. So unless a unless a kindly passerby finds them. Um, they they are doomed. They're very vulnerable to be predated by you know cats and dogs and things like that. So, and this is a problem around the world. But it's one that's actually quite easily solved. Even if you know you say to people, okay, look, have your street lights during this part of the year. But you could you could just keep the lighting down from maybe you know the the middle of August until the end of September, and that would make a huge difference and i think this, the buy-in to things like this can be quite good really if things if things are presented in the right way and people feel that they have an ownership i was very impressed there in carol's video that the people of mulrani have done so much to restore that dune habitat what's an incredible you know that's a very encouraging um and very a very encouraging kind of a situation uh, and one which i feel is happening maybe more and more um for many years in this sort of wildlife conservation i used to be uh uh, I used to be, you know, concerned that everything was just going to get worse. But now I think that actually there are a lot of people on board, and particularly in Ireland, I think we have the opportunity to make everything vastly better. And I'm hoping that's what's actually going to happen in the future. Um, now, there's an event that happens. Uh, there's, a, a, there's a nighttime event that happens in Clue Bay, and one that very few people have witnessed. In the month of, of October... Uh, there's an extraordinary migration that happens and it tends to happen after a storm. Now we have the European eel in this country and uh, it's uh, an Andromedus fish, or one that moves between freshwater and uh, seawater. Now most fish that do that, the salmon and the trout and things, they are born in rivers and they migrate to the sea to feed. But eels do the opposite, they're born in the sea and they migrate uh, to rivers to live out their lives. And they're born in the Saragossa Sea at the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, and they drift in plantanic form across the ocean. And these ones, some of them, arrive into Clue Bay and they pick up the scent of a river and they will move up that river. And so there's a particular, the Marine Institute have a, have a, a monitoring station. And essentially, 
in October time, well, first of all, the, the, the animals they move, they move into fresh water and they can spend the next 20, 30, 40 or 50 years living in those river systems, growing sometimes with very little nutrient, very little food in those systems. So they grow very slowly. Now, how do you tell a year's age, uh, an eel's age? Well, unfortunately, you have to dispatch it and uh, look at its inner ear. You actually, and uh, rather like a tree trunk, if you make a section of its inner ear, uh, you can tell how, how old it is. Now, of course, you don't want to be doing that lots, but I suppose it was interesting and important from uh, the terms of science to learn as much as, as we could about them. So that has been discovered that some of these eels are up, the, are up in that sort of, up in the catchment of the Newport River for 50 years, some of the big females. And then they all come down river and they have a system there. It happens on a, on a wet stormy night normally in October, the first big flood and all the mature eels in the catchment, which by now have taken on this sort of a, a silvery cover, the color, they've lost their brown color. Their eyes have gotten bigger to help them with their vision at sea. Uh, they've become silvery in color, which helps them to avoid predation. Uh, and they all come down the river in the middle of the night. And this system they had at, at the Marine Institute, they temporarily get all the eels and they, 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 they catch them funnel them into actually a shed which got a pool there suddenly you're there and hundreds of eels just start arriving in it's an extraordinary sight and they're just having a look at you know how many males are there how many females are there if it's a small eel uh yeah basically males males are small any big eel you see is a female and they then enter the sea and they have to set off across the, the ocean on this extraordinary journey to the other side of the world um, one of those extraordinary migrations and one of those things that is is not seen, one of these great nocturnal events that is not seen. There are so many things that happen at night and so many animals that have become sort of um, nocturnal, uh, sometimes just to avoid us. Um, I spent many years of my life filming tigers in India and tigers uh, in this particular part of India where I work, they were uh, completely nocturnal up to the time that we stopped hunting them. And then they, they sort of uh, start to be seen more and more during the day. And now they're almost equally happy day and night. So I sometimes wonder at so many of these sort of nocturnal animals we have that we associate as being nocturnal. Uh, it's probably some of us, some of it is that they're just avoiding us. I mean, some are obviously nocturnal specialists, the moths and the bats and things like that. But some of them, unfortunately, are probably uh, more nocturnal than they might want to be, uh, just because of our interactions with them. Anyway, um, yeah. did some? Sorry, I thought someone said something. Um, so uh, back to my garden. Um, my garden uh, on the east coast of Ireland. I have to say, it uh, it's given me great pleasure, uh, great pleasure. That sense of trying to create something. Um, on a one acre plot of land, uh, create something, a home for the smaller creatures. And that's what I'm trying to hopefully encourage people to do with this, with this particular program is to look how they garden. And if you go native, native plants are essential for native insects. Um, moths aren't as, as fussy as maybe butterflies. Butterflies can have very sp specific food plants. And if they don't exist in your garden, then there's no place for them. Um, I used to think just putting up a butterfly bush was enough. That just gives them a little bit of food and nectar. But if you really want to, uh, if you really want to get insects back in your life, the insects that drive the bat world and indeed that drive the natural world, what you've got to do is to look after your native plants. They have been sold to us as weeds in recent years. The gardening horticultural lobby have sold them to us as weeds, but they in fact are the most valuable plants out there. And if you want thriving habitats, they are always based on a thriving native flora. But I'm hoping that over the years, over the years that pass, I'll do min minimal management here and go to as many plants as I can have. The insect populations will come and hopefully, hopefully those creatures of the night uh, will be there in abundance. Um, I've just got myself, uh, or I'm just getting myself a moth trap, and I intend to spend as a whole crowd of people, a whole community out there, mad crowd of people around uh, around Ireland, uh, tropping, 
tropping moths, trapping moths. And it really is, it, it's extraordinary. You'd be amazed that we only have about 36, seven species of butterflies in Ireland, but maybe, well, well over a thousand, I don't know, 13, 1400 species of moths. There's amazing diversity out there. And it's something that uh, I've got to get to learn more about, not just to identify uh, what they look like, to be able to name them, but actually find out how they uh, interact with the natural world at night. Um, look, all this talk of night makes me think about the dawn, and I think someone was going to have a had, had, had something queued up. Yeah. Um, a little scene from another film I made called uh, "The Secret Life of the Shannon." A few years back, uh, it was edited uh, by a woman called Emer, uh, uh, who did uh, Emer Reynolds did a wonderful editing job on this. And this, uh, these films, are, uh, the, the production company I work with, are called Crossing the Line Films, who are now based in Mayo, are now based in West Port, just down the road from me. So it's good to have them at this part of the world. Anyway, everyone, look, thank you very much for joining wherever you are in the world. And uh, hopefully you'll come and visit us sometime because once this virus goes away, uh, this is, uh, this is, I think, well, the, 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 even the, the, the video, the pictures that Carol showed us earlier, I thought were pretty inspiring. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Colin. We'll just play your little piece there now. The sound coming through there, Carol. Yeah, it is, yeah. Early mornings for me are some of the best times. The dawn chorus comes and the reeds are full of bird song and it's a wonderful, happy time. time to be on the river. It's time to find food because you've been building up an appetite all night. Time to find a mate. A time to declare your intentions. This is still my patch. This is my part of this river bank. It's a wonderful, peaceful time of day. And the light, if you're out there at sunrise, sometimes the light is so, so special. Thanks, George. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's fantastic, Colin. Thanks a million. I see oh. there's a, yes, yeah, beautiful, beautiful footage. There's a couple of little questions in the Q&A. We might just have a look at them. Sure, there's, no worries. Somebody's asked, what is a bat detector, Colin? That's the first one. A bat detector, good question. Um, bats uh, communicate um, at such a sort of high level of sound that we can't hear it. And the bat detector eventually, essentially takes that sound and uh, turns it into a sound that we can hear. So not, it's not the real sound the bat is actually making, but it's a sort of a manufacture, it takes us down to our level by, by, by uh, dialing, you, on this detector you have a dial with different frequencies. Every bat in Ireland calls at a particular frequency. And so by using this dial, you can actually identify what bat is calling. Now, it's not quite as simple as it sounds. In the beginning, it's a bit confusing. They all sound pretty similar. But it's like learning bird song or something. You learn one and then you learn another. And, you know, there are a couple of, some of the bats in Ireland are really rare. Uh, and some of them are very distinctive sounds. So it's actually not that difficult. And there's something, even if there's a bat uh, detector in the community, it's a great thing just to be able to go out at night. And, that, that, you know, you think that the world is silent, uh, but thankfully we cannot hear the calls of bats because if we could, we would be driven absolutely yes. nuts because okay. it's a really, really loud sound. All right. Thanks very much, Colin. Yeah, I see there's another one there. Somebody wants to know, what do you think of the walrus that's been seen in Kerry in Wales recently? What, what do you make of that? Well, I just hope it finds its way home. I mean, you get these vagrants and I always feel pretty sorry for them. It's never a good sign if an animal is completely off course. 
So I hope it makes it. I, last I heard of it, I say it was in Wales. It was there for a while. It appeared to be feeding, but it's got an awful long way to go home. And you have to ask yourself, well, how did it end up here? It's something maybe isn't quite right. I would think, okay. but hopefully, uh, I mean, amazing size. They've actually turned up in Clue Bay before. They turned up in Clue Bay, I think, in the uh, 1970s, up by Old Ted, oh. maybe into the 80s. Yeah, the rock, okay. Very one of the rocks yeah. out of out of out of the Old Ted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it'll get home. Okay. Yeah, somebody has another thing. They said, uh, Colin, about one week ago, I saw what looked like a nut tree tussock moth at dusk on a mild day near some trees at Clue Bay. Are these unusual in Ireland? I've heard of it. A nut tree tussock moth. I've heard of a tussock moth. What yeah. did you say? A nut tree. A nut tree tussock moth. Uh, hopefully there's a moth person. Hopefully we've got someone like Wendy I... Stringer who's on this someplace and she can maybe say, I've heard of tussock moths, okay? And they are around. Uh, they are around at the moment. I think some of them are in flight right now, as far as I know. Okay. Um, but uh, that is what, as there are so many species of moth. I've got a lot to learn about. Them. Yeah, yeah. So that's something about the project I'm working on right now is that I'm learning about things that I really hadn't spent a lot of time on before. And the things, you know, I've traveled all around the world observing wildlife and I've ignored many of the interesting little things that, that live around me. So that's, uh, the, well, that's one thing, that's one thing you're going to find out about. Yeah, there was another one there. Somebody asked it, and I know the answer to this myself, but I, have you ever seen a murmuration? I certainly have. There's a fabulous murmuration going on. That's a starling murmuration, uh, particularly in winter. Uh, we have our native starling population, but in winter we are joined by huge volumes of birds from northern Europe and Russian places. They all come down to Ireland where the ground, where, where, where they can forage. They need open, soft ground in which to forage. And you get these massive, just last thing, last time of the day, they get together. They're tens of thousands sometimes. Uh, there's one in Loch Ennell in West Mead at the moment, and there's just vast numbers of birds there and it really is something worth witnessing the sound as they go overhead you know myriads of beating wings all probably in an effort to avoid predation you get yeah. the old sparrow hawk around and you see them go into the middle of the pile they come out with one but oh, your individual gosh. chances have been taken are pretty small yeah yeah but, um, they're in the, they're, yeah they are extraordinary and extraordinary sight the greatest spectacle in ireland i suppose yeah it was on you had part of you show that in your on the program on the shannon i remember seeing it it was amazing that's right. That's looked right. Fabulous. That's right. Yeah, it was absolutely yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. And yeah. uh, there's another one here now. Yes, this is a technical question for you, Colin. What mm -hmm. type of filming camera gear do you use at night? Uh, well, it? nowadays, the, mm. well, there's all, there's all sorts of stuff. Now that you, it used to be extremely sort of expensive technology or very basic. When I first started, we were using these little sort of security cameras with lenses, and the quality wasn't very good. But now there's some of these little uh, still Sony cameras. And they have an incredible night vision uh, um, ability. We were shooting something just the other week. I've got my little sort of cabin, a glorified garden shed. I wouldn't say it's even glorified. It's basically a garden shed. And that's where I stay when I'm in Wicklow and I'm just living by candlelight in the evenings. But I had a candle outside or a little lamp that just had a sin single candle flame that was almost too bright for the camera. And this is like a kind of consumer price camera, you know, it's still much like 1500 quid or something, but it's not something that years ago might have cost 50,000 or 100,000. Very good. It's amazing yeah. what the technology can do. Yeah, yeah. This one, now, a lot of people are looking for the asking this question, um, Colin. Colin, thank you for your wonderful talk. I really want to be a wildlife filmmaker, but I don't really know where to start. Do you have any tips you could share? Oh, yeah. Well, it's a tough one. Basically, <laughs> yeah. if you want to be one, I'd say a lot of people, well, some people might, might think they want to be one. And But if you want to be a camera person, which is what I, how I sort of started, that's what I did. That's what I've done mostly. Um, essentially, you have to go out and start filming things. And uh, it's, it's not that. Uh, and what I would say is if you watch a wildlife documentary, any wildlife documentary, just turn down the sound. That makes you concentrate on the pictures. So you really concentrate on what happens within that frame. The great thing about as a as a learning resource, it's amazing because all these great films are out there. And by turning off the sound and just watching the pictures, you can really you can really teach yourself an awful lot. I mean, I'm most people are pretty much self-taught. Um, and then you phone up your mates if you're not quite sure about something, you know, a technicality or something. Okay. But it's just a question of that actually going there. I mean, someone just contacted me last year. Quite a few people did and said, look, have you got something that have you got something to show me? And most of them didn't. But then one of them did. And he's now working in the industry. So oh, it's cool. just it's it's, I suppose, about showing and proving your interest. And then 
you know, sticking at it. Pretty much anyone I know who really stuck at it, and it is competitive industry to get into, mm. but anyone I know who actually stayed, you know, stuck at it, they got into it eventually. Oh, very so, good, yeah. But it's a tough, it's a it's a tough industry. I mean, work, yeah. you never know where it's coming from. And I've been doing it a long time, but I never knew where, where the next job is coming from, and that's sort okay. of thing. Okay, very good. Yeah, here's another. When is your garden program starting on BBC? I believe it's in November. There's a series called Gardener's World with Monty Don, and basically it stops and I take over that slot for the next two weeks. Uh, but I'm sort of like the anti-gardener really oh, because, okay very um, good yeah you're not I'm, going to be neat and tidy Colin is that yes, it I'm not going to be popular no. either. yeah yeah I know that yeah, that's fine yeah anyway I, uh, but it's all about just what I'm doing I'm not trying to tell anyone else how to live their life I'm just saying yeah. this is what I'm doing and these are the reasons I'm doing it the sense very that good. I want to be empowered to do something and I think a lot of people feel like that they want to do something uh, there's sometimes a lot of bad news about the natural world out there and so this is a way of making you feel better so it's a win-win very good. I, I have a question actually. It's not if people don't mind. I know when you were filming that um the show on the Shannon, with oh, yeah. Shannon and there was a lone corn crake calling for a female. I call yeah, he was calling and there was no female answering. Did you ever find out if corn crakes come back or what happened? Or you to never found out? To my knowledge, they didn't. Um oh. they were probably there were quite a few left around the Shannon. Um, and people sort of go, this is a population that we have to look yeah. after. My sense is that might, the only reason they were there was that there was no place else for them to be. But they had been pushed into non-ideal habitats. Habitat, long grass, okay, and lots of insects, but land that's prone to flooding and things like that. And so I think this is where they were making their stand in the middle of Ireland. But I think it was the last of them and that oh. population just shrinking and shrinking. But on the West Coast, you know, they're holding their own and there were schemes in place for farmers is to farm the land in particular ways to encourage them and to bring them back so yeah. hopefully hopefully, hopefully yeah i just thought that was really it was very evocative that piece you know the poor yeah and nobody there it always struck me it's kind of stuck in my head you know so yeah. george i've kind of lost track of the questions now where are we yeah. okay your grand um carol just <laughs> just a, um on the nut tree uh tussock moth um anthony pickering has kindly put in a oh, yes. uh, a link there so uh, people can find out a little bit more about about it on the species distribution in Ireland. Um, so Great. Thank Thanks, Georgia. Um, so, Great. Uh, Carol, we're just up to Mary um, Grimidgen. Uh, will the cold weather we are having now on the West Coast delay the end of hibernation of bats and hedgehogs? They don't seem to be around yet. Well, I think what might have been, they might have been out a certain amount. And I, it's, you know, it, it, bats tend to sort of wake up, often don't have this solid hibernation too. They can react to changes in weather. So if it's cold for a few days, they'll just go into sort of like a, a torpor for a few days and be ready to come out again. There has been some bat activity around, maybe limited all right, but some of the warmer nights, they were certainly active. So, um, yeah, I'm sure they're going to be pretty quiet for the next couple of nights because there's going to be no insects flying and there's no point flying around flying around at night looking for something that isn't there but hopefully they should be fine you know it's only a couple of nights but we could do with a bit of warmth you sense all the trees are waiting all the plants are just ready to burst into life the light is there and that it's been a little damp and now all they just need is that uh, that little bit of warmth and hopefully uh, in a week or two the landscape will transform the yeah. bats will be happy there'll be lots of insects yeah, yeah. but I mean, just take maybe one or two more questions Colin there's one here um Hi, Colin. Love the talk. I was wondering what was one of the most cool, interesting things you have seen while traveling and filming. Oh, wow. Well, um, <laughs> it's hard. Uh, I mean, when I first went traveling, when I was a young fellow, I went backpacking for a few years and I walked across Papua New Guinea in the early 80s in search of birds of paradise. And I think one of the nicest surprises was wandering around for a couple of days and looking for these birds of paradise and having no luck. Uh, whatsoever and setting up my tree in the uh, setting up my tent then in the evening by a little stream and under this tree and waking up in the morning to this really loud sort of raucous sound thinking what on earth is going on crawling out of my tent and looking up on the tree and I had camped under uh, the display lek of these uh, Rajiana's birds of paradise and they were all displaying above my head so that is something that was just completely unexpected again I think that sense of the um uh, you know, things being unexpected is so nice. 
you know, you might go to, I don't see a starting murmuration, but you know you're already going to see it sort of thing. But when something just happens out of the blue, I think it makes it extra special. And then any moment I spent with tigers, because tigers are just extraordinary animals, and I got to know an awful lot about them and learn a lot about them. And so, uh, yeah, they are, um, yeah, oh, but uh, yeah, so many simple, yeah, things. Jaguar, maybe, suddenly yeah. Jaguar coming out of the bush, all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, sounds amazing. Yeah, you've had an amazing time, uh, Colin. You've seen some amazing things, haven't you, really? I've been lucky enough in that sense, yeah, but not of, but, you know, with constant travel, there are, you know, there are downsides too, but uh, there aren't that many of them, but still, um, yeah, but still, I have to say, I, I'm just uh, revved up and ready to go now, okay? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, good, I'm yeah. feeling the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, you're and locked in. <laughs> yeah, 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 but it's a new world and it's a world of, you know, carbon and new carbon world and all that sort of thing. So it's going to change everything in the long term. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sort of had the best. Our generation had the the best of everything, really. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, that ability to travel anywhere without feeling guilty. Yeah, and it's all going to be different from here on in. I think. Yeah. And I bring people on tours around the world to see tigers, to see jaguars, and now have to really look at how you know you can justify that, and and uh, to make sure that money then at least is left behind directly for conservation projects and things but because i guess people are going to travel anyway but uh, yeah, yeah yeah they were very good part of the yeah. picture yeah we might just do one more i think and then because we're we've gone after eight o'clock there's one here um from robert Coyne. are there any native specific night scented plant species that would be great to plant for bats well i think uh, oh for bat yeah well uh, i just planted a load of honeysuckle this week and the honeysuckle is one of those things that you were talking about the campion earlier. It starts to smell beautifully uh, in the evenings. You get that lovely, strong, heady scent, and that's attracting lots of moths. Uh, and that, in turn, hopefully, is um, attracting the bats. So that's one. Yeah, that's a climber. That's a climber that I have just put in this week. The thing about bat, uh, the, the good thing about moths is they're not quite as fussy, for instance, as some butterflies. Moths will often eat a range of food plants. So that's a massive advantage. If you're able to eat lots of different things, your chances of living in an area are a lot higher. Whereas butterflies can be very restricted to, as I say, to very specific things. Okay, very good. I think, is there any more, Georgia, there now? I think we're... Your sound is off there, Georgia, yeah. Um, uh, PJ Rankin, who's one of the hosts uh, from earlier this week, um, is uh, just saying, great to hear your talk, Colin. He did a bit of work with crossing the line on a, a wild Irish year a few years back. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, covering the schools. Um, a fascinating experience, um, once thriving community. Is there any specific wildlife al along the Mayo Islands that you have yet to witness or cover in either your personal or professional ca capacity? Oh, well, I've tried to root out as many as I can. Things like skewers and shearwaters all the more sort of obvious ones I have done. There's probably, I mean, what I haven't done so much is explore the underwater world of the West of Ireland. And that's the thing, that's where I'm pr pretty ignorant actually, because I've got an awful lot to learn about that. And I think it's something that we don't maybe push enough um, in Ireland is that, of snorkeling, diving. It, it takes all sorts of, you know, you need all your gear and, and the expense of it. But the idea of having sort of snorkel trails around the west coast of Ireland, there's incredible snorkeling here. There's a huge opportunities. And when you put on a mask and snorkel and put your head in the water, you really enter another world. And that is uh, something I think maybe we don't think enough about. I do it in rivers and lakes and things too. That's great. You're just swimming along. You're just looking at all these things. And sometimes there's nothing that much to see, but that's just relaxing. And then every so often you see something amazing. So snorkeling is something that... Uh, I should do more of and learn about marine life in that way. But specifically, I can't think of a, a species that I've yet to sort of observe or film along the West Coast. If I think of one, I'll, or, you know, something that I haven't done yet. But I'm, I'm yeah. sure it's something. Yeah, yeah, it's something. great. Yeah, there's some lovely comments there as well. Somebody's going to plant the honeysuckle. I think Pamela, they're going to plant the honeysuckle straight away, obviously. It's <laughs> great. Some lovely comments here. Just thanking you for your talk, Colin. Everyone has really enjoyed it. Ah, it yeah, so really lovely, lovely comments here. So I think we're probably ready to wrap it up, Georgia. I just want to thank Colin very much for coming along. It's been absolutely fantastic, Colin. We know you're a very busy man. I know you can't oh, go, no Rob. I know you're still busy. So look, we really appreciate you joining us tonight. It's been absolutely fantastic. Love listening to your, love your programs. It's been fantastic.
have you and thanks a million for joining us. I know George no worries. say something. Yeah. Well, just just to echo that, Colin, it's been uh, been an absolute thrill to have you. Um, and thank you. I know you, you're so busy, as, as Carol said. And I have to say thank you, Carol, for hosting us okay. um, tonight. Yeah. Um, really feel like we visited Mulrani. Um, yeah. and, uh, that's a, there's lo lots of reasons to come back again very soon. So I'm, I'm sure lots of people who are attending will do so. Um, if we could maybe just finish. We had one poll, um, Carol, that we were setting up earlier. Yeah. So, um, we might just run that uh, to, to close off the night. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question, which do you prefer, moths or butterflies? So uh, we might just pop that out there and see what what everyone thinks. And we're, we're fighting for the, the, the nocturnal <laughs> species, not to <laughs> fall in any way, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see now. We've most people voted now. Oh no, you are. And folks, just while you're voting, um, tomorrow evening is our final night of the Mayo Roadshow, and we move to the island of Inishturk, uh, where we'll be hosted by uh, Mary Helena O'Toole, and we will be meeting astronomer Brendan Owens for um, the star on our doorstep. So we started with the planet Mars at the beginning of the week and we end with the star on our doorstep. So here's the end of our poll. Uh, let's share results and as we might have thought um, butterflies yeah. just nailed it there. So yeah. um, spare <laughs> thought for the, for the beautiful moths that we have in Ireland, uh, the nocturnal species. Um, Colin and Carol, thank you so, so much. Uh, for Thanks, Georgia. Um, Thanks, Georgia. Thank yeah, you. thanks everyone. It was great. Yeah. See you again soon. Okay. Thank you. All the best. Okay. All the best. Thanks, Carla. Bye, thanks, bye. Georgia. Bye. 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 See you, Georgia. Thanks so much, Carol. Thanks, Georgia. Bye.